So welcome. Uh, hey, Bill. <laughs> welcome to the wonderful world of artist books. <clears throat> so uh, before I have our guests introduce themselves, uh, I, I, I kind of know everybody here. So you know who I am, you know about EFA. And uh, the way this came up as we were planning programming for for the studio program, uh, most of the things we do, we're having receptions all the time. We're having exhibitions in the office. We're doing the holiday party. Well, all that has come to a crashing halt. So we have been trying to figure out ways to stay in touch. And I decided that once a month, I would invite some people I like and to have a conversation about something I'm interested in and hopefully other people are interested in. So this came about because uh, Anthony Tino and Jared Ash both did presentations to my Pratt class. So I teach a professional practice class at Pratt and uh, it was wonderful. And Paul John was also on. And um, when it was over, I realized that I really don't exactly know what artist books are that uh, although we were discussing them. So I looked it up in Wikipedia and I'll read you the definition. Artist books are books or book-like objects over the final appearance of which an artist has had a high degree of control where the book is intended as a work of art in itself. So uh, anyway, just that, that, I read that definition, but I, I'm very, I say I have a lot of curious about exactly what an artist book is. Uh, because it also seems like something that's fairly recent. I mean, I don't think Rembrandt did any artist book. I know he did a lot of etchings. So I'd like for us to get into a little bit about the history, uh, exactly what they are, when they got started. Uh, let me introduce our guests. I'm going to just read off your titles first, but I'm not going to read your bios. I'm just going to let you each introduce yourself and talk about what it is that you do and, you know, what your connection to artist books are. So Jared Ash is Associate Museum Librarian, Slavic and Special Collections at the Thomas J. Watson Library at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's quite a title you got there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Paul John is the co-founder of Endless Editions and board member of Center for the Book Arts. And Anthony Tino, he, the, the title, title you wanted me to give him is creative producer. I like that. <laughs> but is also uh, fully booked. So Jared, why don't we start with you and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, um, thank you. And thank you, Bill, for inviting me and us. And thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, so I, uh, yeah, my name's Jared. Um, I'm a librarian at Watson Library at the Met. Uh, which is open to everybody and all, um, in case you don't know, uh, we're in the main building, there is a library there, it's a million art books, so please come by, not yet, because we're still closed, but, um, you know, in the post-COVID wonderful afterworld, um, we always love to see people. Um, I, <clears throat> my connection to artist books is, is um, through kind of Russian studies background, um, I studied uh, Russian as an undergraduate and discovered Russian avant-garde, which is kind of this period in time from 1910s to 30s, artists like Kazimir Malievich, um, Goncharova, Natalia Goncharova, um, amazing people, El Lissitsky. Uh, and I wound up finding this gallery where specialized in photographs and uh, books uh, published during that time. Um, I kind of developed this little expertise. Um, I got to put together a collection of about a thousand books. I don't know if people, there was a show at MoMA about 2002 called Russian Avant-Garde Book. Um, I got to work on that. And um, then I kind of realized that there was a big strong connection between historic books from this period and kind of contemporary um, Russian public, uh, contemporary artist publications that a lot of the same things. And I'll kind of, you know, talk about that a bit more later. But um, so that's kind of, and then I've just been working kind of as a librarian, as a curator, working with artist books from, from back then and from today um, throughout. Excellent, thank you, Jared. So let's go alphabetically. PJ. <clears throat> I am uh, Paul John, uh, 
co-founder of Endless Editions, but I also work at EFA uh, at the Robert Blackburn for Making Workshop where I run the Rizzo Room. And uh, I teach at the School of Visual Arts, uh, again in Rizzo Printing and have done workshops at various institutions. Um, and uh, I'm also a photographer and I make photo books. And I've been working with Anthony since early days, maybe 2010, 2011, uh, and at EFA since 2012. Okay, Anthony. Hi everyone, I'm Anthony Tino. Um, some of you might know me from EFA um, back in 2015, I think, uh, when I was briefly there covering for Natalia Nakazawa in the studio department. Um, I'm also a co-founder of Endless Editions. I, I didn't want my title tonight to just be like co-founder of this, co-founder of that, but um, PJ and I co-founded Endless Editions back in about 2014, um, where, uh, you know, after we came from a background in printmaking and studied together at New Paltz, um, we kind of came to um, artist books through kind of, um, you know, what, what makes it unique in its history to begin with, where we, you know, we're looking for ways to collaborate with artists and a cost-effective way without a studio. Um, and since then have been involved with artist books in um, several capacities. Um, uh, the, the next platform that I uh, co-founded is called Fully Booked which started as an art book fair in Dubai, which ran for three years. Um, we also did um, a art book fair in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia during the um, 2139 festival in 2018. Um, and then the platform kind of um, transformed into more of a uh, distribution uh, focused platform. Um, so we weren't necessarily making as much stuff as we were kind of uh, distributing artist books from a specific region um, of North Africa, Middle East, South Asia. And now I'm sort of, um, you know, doing this whole pandemic thing and made, made a book of my own for the first time in a long time. Um, and yeah, that's, that's uh, I think that should cover the basics for now. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so one, as I say, I, I just uh, read you the definition of artist books, but I would love to get a little bit of the history. Like at what point did artists start making books that are called artist books? And I don't know, maybe Jared, you could. Sure, I mean, I, I can kick things off. Um, so kind of the, the connection, um, I mean, artist books as we kind of see them today are generally kind of a 20th, early 20th century thing. So um, they were kind of emerged. I mean, I, you know, draw everything back to Russia. That's my area of expertise. So I mean, my area of specialty. So, um, you know, it was all, it was, everything was, was all Russia. They, they were on top of everything. But um, in this regard, they kind of were. So um, they really emerged as, and kind of the kind of like zines and the kinds of publications that Paul John and Anthony are working with are, you know, kind of in this um, non-mainstream or kind of other, you know, um, voices kind of that really wouldn't, don't have other platforms, aren't in the mainstream, aren't commercially viable necessarily. Um, a lot of artists self kind of public, not self-publishing, but kind of getting, you know, really taking means and, and through with assistance from others, helping to get their their art out. Um, I'll do a little, so this is like around, I, am, I have too many slides. I'm gonna do a really quick, fast thing to kind of explain if I can. Um, it's a little for people who might, you know, not be familiar with the material um, and working on kind of how it ties in with kind of today's like artist publications of today. Um, there were things like, um, so like early, this is around 1910, 1912, and Russian avant-garde artists like Natalia Goncharova on the right, Mikhail Arionov, with like, like say Kruchonik, were really out there to kind of shake things up. Um, these artists, they'd like do things like they were not at all interested in kind of being part of, and they weren't accepted by like the academy. People like, um, actually, am I doing the right 
you guys can see. Let me stop sharing that and share a different one. Um, so basically, um, they would do things like they, they were really disruptors and they would kind of go out and they would do these futurist trolls. It was poets, it was artists all coming together with work that was so far a field from anything that was kind of conventional or traditional or widely accepted. So it wasn't like the symbolists with their kind of bourgeois kind of ivory tower stuff. They were doing things like word creation, like transactional poetry. And this was the kind of thing that their work was going up against. This was kind of the standard. These were the top established, most celebrated, most widely, you know, praised and hailed kind of artists of the time. Early 1900s, there was world of art. Everything was very kind of refined. There was a lot of kind of rhyming between letter forms. Um, it was really, I mean, because as it like refined and elegant, it was very kind of luxurious. Each edition, when they did their publications and their books, it would be like five copies on this paper, you know, 20 copies on this paper, each one more kind of elaborate and luxuriant and expensive than the next, um, gilt edged kind of thing. Um, so these were kind of, you know, and there was a whole culture called kind of the aesthetes of the book um, who were really into everything being very refined. And then Russian avant-garde artists came along and totally wanted to do something on the complete end of the other end of the um, spectrum. So here was a book that was published on wallpaper intentionally, kind of, um, it was like very common wallpaper. They put out manifestos, like a slap in the face of public taste. Um, they were really trying to be provocative. The face painting, they would go on these strolls where they'd kind of just walk through the streets of Moscow and Petersburg spouting poetry. And here we have a book that's bound in burlap sack, which was kind of the material that peasants wore on their feet. Um, and then they also deliberately rejected kind of the established kind of conventional, I mean, industry. They were really doing things to subvert whole notions of reproduction. Um, they wanted to reassert the hand of the artist within their publication. They were also really interested in kind of re-endowing letter forms, um, the written word with some expressive uh, powers that had been lost by just using these, like this very boring basic type. Um, and they, there was a lot of collaboration, um, wanted the, the text to kind of really resonate with, with the images. Um, in terms of like artist books, it was some to kind of enhance, you know, Bill's definition, you know, or kind of sharing that with us from Wikipedia. I mean, one of the things is, is always kind of like, you can't really separate, like an artist book doesn't translate to like a, a plain text version. Like you can't take out the images and, you know, or, or the book form and it's, it's, it would cease to be the work that it is. Like it couldn't exist. It would be a text, but it wouldn't be the same thing. So here, like you can't really, you can kind of pull these things out, but they lose their meanings. These are all poems. These are all letter forms. Um, these are kind of more sounds and transrational poems, like beyond sense, um, oy, 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 like uchede, meli, these is kind of like made up, you know, words, um, because they thought like, you know, you couldn't even use the word rose. And like, what can you do? Like, you can't use rose in anything because rose already brings with it all these, you know, pre-assigned connotations, like that's, that's a dead word. And so they kind of were into word creation. And artists like Malievich, I mean, kind of doing forms, and this was cheap paper, they would do things like, um, in addition to kind of going back towards archaic forms of like uh, production, like lithography, um, they were, were using rubber stamps. They were kind of trying to find alternative mediums and, and processes because first of all, they couldn't, you had to have things officially approved to, to print, to do actual editions. They were having people like there was a German typesetter who there's a German newspaper printer um, who wound up printing one of their first books because he didn't understand or realize what it was. Um, it, there's all stories about kind of the publishers and printers getting really nervous about the stuff being in their shops and, and really kind of trying to get rid of it quickly. Um, and here's another way of kind of subverting this, this reproduction. I mean, here is rubber stamping, but between, you know, stamping and everything is it's about the ease and kind of the efficiency of the reproduction here. They would actually re-rack. This is the same page in two different books. And you can see that they changed letters. It's the same text, but like even from one edition to the next, they would kind of vary letters and change letters and you have capitals and lowercase and um, really everything. There's great variety from one to the next. Um, and then just using letter forms as visual elements and, and aesthetics in themselves, um, kind of just visual devices. Um, this is reproduced by um, hectography, kind of a glass plate process. You can usually get kind of 20 prints out of that. Um, here, they would just use carbon paper and you can see kind of the impressions going through. Um, and they were also really, you know, it was body. It was very fun. You know, they were like, um, it was very humorous. I mean, all these things that kind of carry through still to artist books today, um, sort of elements, it's very 
kind of witty. Um, but here you have them using kind of traditional forms of like a old, like traditional sacred texts from Orthodox Church. And uh, this is a story about a demon sodomizing a woman and kind of, you know, but using it in these, you know, really established, revered forms. Um, and here's a book by Ella Sitsky, um, which again uses kind of a traditional Jewish form, uh, the text and this scroll. But it's a story about um, an artist or a poet who kind of abandons, you know, his studies of, uh, you know, Judaic texts to follow his muse and kind of the arts. Um, it was a, a medium that really allowed itself. Um, this is the first kind of appearance of collage, like abstract collage forms in book form. Um, this is Natalia Goncharova, and each uh, cover here was different. Um, we saw this kind of then, again, collage in 1916. This is the artist, actually Alexei Kruchenik, who's mostly a poet. Um, this is all cut and pasted papers, you know, decades before Matisse did jazz, um, kind of just using these abstract forms. And these are some cover designs by Alexander Rodchenko, um, kind of using kind of other prints, um, line of cuts and collage. And then I have a few pictures here just to kind of give people an overview of, of um, the, the variety here and, and the time. So things kind of, you know, artist books, they're different from Livre d'Artiste, you know, which were kind of done by big name artists in the turn, beginning of the century, um, kind of big print, luxurious print editions, um, like Picasso or, um, you know, Juan Gris, some of the Cubist artists, um, as a way to kind of for publishers to make money. Um, they're also different than, and they're not just illustrated books. Um, so here, and when they kind of came to the U.S., when they kind of first emerged here, what you saw first was kind of things taking innovative forms like exhibition catalogs. This was a book designed by Ed Ruscha, but it's using sandpaper, commercial flecking, like kind of that felt material like you see on t-shirts. Um, this is an exhibition catalog for Billy L. Bankston bound with these kind of screws here. So if you put the book next to anything, it destroys anything it touches. Uh, here's like the satchel kind of thing with um, by Jean Tinglet, <laughs> like an exhibition catalog of the Ruscha things. You also have things like artists like James Rosenquist. There was a period where artists who were selling already paintings for a lot of money wanted their work to be more affordable and accessible and they wanted their books to, their work in the hands of a lot more people than just one person who owned a, a, a painting so this would be sell for two dollars or three dollars there's like chuck close some others um Sala Witt, alter text these are images from i had curated an artist book show at newark public library in newark new jersey where i was for about six years 2008 and realized that these just get very good overviews um and kind of using some of the things that the Russian futures had done was using material like kind of processes and materials that weren't intended for fine art purposes. So they'd use wallpaper, they used um, rubber stamping, um, things that were kind of just, you know, appropriating these commercial or other technologies. And first we saw that with kind of Xeroxes, um, Xerox machines and Xerox art, uh, with Netherland who put together this collaborative work, um, International Society for Copy Artists, and then again, kind of just showing some of the variety as possible. Rubber stamping um, forms that some of them can be really super elaborate, um, offset printing, using different materials, different forms and formats, um, records. It's really kind of, you know, the sky's the limit here. So just to, to give you a little bit of an overview of, and again, using untraditional, unconventional materials. Um, and then, you know, we, again, as back then, you see also the use of handwritten text and letter forms, again, to add just further elements of expression. So, um, so that's a little bit, hopefully I kind of provided some, you know, an overview, um, some kind of the scope and the history of, you know, then and now. And No, that, that's great. So, so really it, it started with the Russians and before that there was no, nothing like the, the very first artist book by somebody else that uh, it was really, that was it. I mean, there were kind of like probably some book objects. There were things that, um, you know, there was a lot of self-publication. I mean, one of the big themes was work that was either non, you know, not commercially viable or expressed kind of view, views that were politically uncomfortable for many or kind of went against the, the dominant, you know, kind of forces in, in power. Um, in this kind of context, I mean, you had Italian futurists did things and, and, you know, that was also very expressive text, but it wasn't kind of in that same spirit of, you know, um, directly kind of challenging um, established forms. And stuff. Um, but I, I mean, I think it all, most histories, I think, kind of tie it back to the Russians. There are other things like Ubu Roy, there are some other kind of things, but as far as pushing materials and this kind of um, un unconventional forms and printing and places. Uh, that was I, great. I, Thank I, you. The visuals, sure. man, they look great. So uh, bringing us into 
the contemporary moment, uh, both Anthony and uh, Paul John are involved with currently working with artists and doing artist books. So do, does one of you want to talk about, uh, do you want to go ahead, PJ, and uh, talk about Endless Editions? <clears throat> Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I can. I can uh, talk a little bit. And actually, Jared uh, so kindly showed one of our newest publications um, by Lucesa Braffman Versimio. We are all speaking at the same time, um, but uh, maybe I can just give like a brief history of like how Endless Editions came to be and what we do currently. Um, yes. And. Uh, Endless Editions uh, was started by me and Anthony. I think your first idea came in 2013 um, when I had just acquired uh, a risograph printer and moved it into my apartment. Um, Could you, because I did, I went through this with the class too. Nobody knew what a risograph printer is. Could you? Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> of course, te yeah. Textbooks has the good riso definition. Let me see. But PJ, do you wanna? I have some images I can share. I also have some really bad first tests that- Oh yeah, yeah, okay. show, show those. Show, okay. Show those and, so, and we can maybe just chat about like the beginnings of endless editions and- um... So yeah, I was just going through some old um, like really old endless stuff. And I think the first Rizo we like tried to make together was this one. Let me see, slideshow. Uh, oh no, um, to, to, to play from current slide. So this was sort of like a, like an early four color separation from just a screen grab from a, from a phone. So basically, you know, Rezo duplicator, it's kind of like for people who are more printmaking savvy, it's sort of like a, a mimeograph, um, though you can, um, you know, you could use digital files at, at this point, but it's, it's, um, it's basically a, a stencil duplicator, um, but it's about the size of a giant Xerox machine. So it's a little bit like having a small, um, a small offset press kind of situation in, you know, that you could have in the corner of your studio or office. Um, these were some tests we did with an artist, Ashley May, um, before uh, producing um, the edition that Endless Editions published, which was kind of a sculptural um, sculptural book. This was, a, a, this is not the um, Rizzo, but this was our like Hanukkah show guidelines. Um, this was from like one of the first things we published, which was a deck of tarot cards by Zebediah Keneally. So, you know, I think it, it became um, quite popular in sort of like cartoon independent comics world, um, but, you know, has, has loads of different um, There's applications. There's in my living yeah. room. And this was kind of the scene from our old production line. Um, so, you know, as you, I mean, and it tends to spill out and like keep getting bigger and bigger. Like the Rizzo sun somehow like sucks in more <laughs> mass, <laughs> but, um, and yeah, that was from, that was an early bag we did. And I think there was one more, this was like, um, you know, trials in photography um, that I was like, man, this is actually kind of nice. <laughs> this is like the, it's like the first Rizzo ever tried to make and you know some some kind of two color so um so I don't know I probably didn't do Rizzo a great job but this is kind of like our early our yeah our early tests in it um I don't know if you and want to add Anthony, anything to that yeah. right and Anthony what kind of additions would you do these in um, we, I think we would normally do like editions of like 200. Oh, wow. Um, it, it varied. Um, and that was all the things that we were kind of figuring out on the way. Um, and I think with like, uh, I, I, I feel like the first sports we made was like an edition of 80 and it was just terribly designed and maybe the most laborious way to make a book. 
and then we yeah. really quickly de decide, like realize that we should probably you know change that <laughs> get better at making books <laughs> get, better, get better at making books and um and i also have like a little i'm not going to show all of these but um i can uh, and who were the and and with these first books? Who were the were, were these things you were? These were your artworks, or were you working with artists? Uh, we were working with artists for the most part. Yeah, um, we prototyped on Anthony uh, Anthony's work at the time. I wasn't really making much work at the time, um, but we also ran a, a gallery in in Chinatown. And I'll just uh, I should oh, just yeah. also probably mention that um, you know this it's whole Bob's thing. Birthday, right? This yeah. whole thing started uh, out of the Robert Blackburn printmaking workshop. And uh, that's where Anthony and I were, were um, killing time, so to speak, uh, by volunteering there. And also we were just uh, members of the community. And it's it, today is Bob's 100th birthday. Had he, had he been alive, he passed away uh, 17 years ago, but um, th today would be his 100th birthday. And he was an incredible person and has an incredible history uh, that you can check out on the EFA RBPMW website. And also you can hear uh, incredible audio interviews with Vincent Smith and Camille Billups and uh, you know a lot of incredible black artists uh, and they're all on the website right now. So please do hop on there and explore in your own time. I'm sure it's fascinating stuff that you could uh, you know, find out how uh, gritty and raw the printmaking workshop was in, in, when it ran. Um, and here's a bunch of photos of Bob and, and his work. Um, and there's me uh, entering the zone. And I'm just going to pass through these slides and get to the Rizzo, which is right here on the right. Um, those are the color drums. So a Rizzo graph kind of is uh, a hybrid between a screen print and a Xerox machine. So if you imagine like a screen from a screen print folded into a cylinder and each cylinder represents its own color uh, and it operates inside of this automated machine that uh, you would interact with as if it was like a regular office copier. And in fact, most of these machines are used in small to mid-range companies such as copy shops, churches, schools, hospitals, automotive shops, anybody that requires a lot of prints uh, of the same thing that doesn't need it to be super refined. It just needs like a thousand valet car tickets or coat check tickets or NCRs. Um, or if you're- Greek diners. Yeah, exactly. Like Rizzo printed. Men menus for to-go uh, restaurants, um, things like that. And, and, and here's- CJ, when, when was oh, Rizzo man, invented? Like when does this go oh, back to? Oh, yeah. No, it's not. Mm. As soon as it's Excuse me. Um, Rizzo, Rizzo is just a company. So uh, the Rizzo Kagu, the company started in the 1940s as well, and they were an ink producer. They started manufacturing Rizzo's in the mid 80s. 1984, I think was the first model, but a stencil duplicator is exactly the same technology or the same concept as the Russian constructivists were using. Like a hectograph is a duplicator. So the, the concept of duplicating has evolved and changed over time. And probably the most recent prior to a, a digital stencil duplicator is probably the mimeograph right. um, or like a Ronio and, and also like a, a spirit duplicator. Those are popular in the eighties as well. Um, but the concept of duplicating has been around forever, but I don't think anybody would have ever considered to, to use it to reproduce full color images. And I think that that's what really drew me and Anthony to the risograph was right. we were looking at it from a printmaking uh Vantage where we were like, oh, people are printing cool things with the risograph, but nobody's really doing full color things. And if they were, it was, you know, in the Netherlands, it wasn't in New York City. So that really was how we approached it in the beginning. It was like a printmaking practice, really like trying to focus and hone our skills. Um, and here's like the back of the machine. And some some of the first prints that we made were single color prints. And here's that exact print that Anthony showed. And the risograph, like other printmaking techniques, require a little bit of precision and skill. So um, there are a lot of errors and, and byproducts um, involved. And so here are all the colors on their own. One of the first prints that we've also made was, you know, kind of a goof and an homage to Al Gore. Um, 
And I think a lot of the work that Anthony and I uh, got along on was, uh, you know, seemingly irreverent, a little lighthearted, but also kind of this theme of inclusivity and um, really thinking about how opportunity is made and offered and how access is granted and thinking about the art market and how do people get shows and how do people find opportunities to be published um, and really thinking about community as, as Bob Blackburn um, created such an incredible community at the print shop, one that continues today. Uh, the print shop still runs in honor and memory of him. The Rizograph community also is, uh, you know, very supportive of each other. And in this photo, you can see people from many different parts of the world. On the right, you have Leo Leon from uh, Gato Negro Editions in Mexico City, Jesjeet and Jenny Gill from uh, Color Code in Toronto, uh, Joyce and Jan Dirk uh, de Wilde, uh, who are probably the first uh, um, first organization to print with the Rizzo technology, and they're based out of Nijmegen in the Netherlands, um, and Caroline uh, Kern from Pegacorn Press in Brooklyn, and next to that, Erica Wilk from Vancouver, in, uh, and we're all standing in a courtyard in Berlin. <laughs> so it just like goes to show that the, the, the books, people in books like tend to move around and carry their books with them. And uh, here's a, a, a spread and keep in touch. And here's a spread from one of the first publications I mentioned sports that we made. Uh, and sports was this open call periodical where we were creating an opportunity for people to be published, generate community. And um, these are just some examples of other publications by Kyrie Johnson Ricks. And clearly Print and Matter was a big influence on us, um, volunteering there, frequenting their events, seeing and learning about artist books there uh, really showed us maybe the gaps that we could fill. And we actually participated in 2014 uh, in a bookmaking residency there where we brought Arizo, worked with people on their books, um, uh, and, and uh, including Josh Smith and did a lot of fairs together. And here's an example of Salonica and the gallery. So there's, Anthony and I worked on a lot of different things. <laughs> Let's just yeah, put it I, that way. I was trying to find the photos of the, of actually the Chinatown space. Cause you know, that, that was kind of an interesting bridge between artist books and like a, an actual like space activation. Um, yeah. So anyway, I, it, well, you want to, you want to, I, I can lead you through these pictures. There's a couple of them here and maybe you want to talk yeah, about, it, about the shows. It, it was a short lived kind of um, um, like definite fire trap in the Lower East Side. Um, but we, we brought a Rizzo down there. We did small exhibitions. We hosted um, uh, some music on the street in the back of a U-Haul truck because the space was too small. Um, we had a small kind of book selection. It was so hot in that space. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's David Senior, who was the librarian at the MoMA Library, visited us. Um, um, oh, is that Joe? Is that Joe Frank? No. No, no. no that's, um, that's, that's Ivan Der and oh, right. uh, Knust and Extra Blue. Oh, from Franz Manzarel. Um, oh, I have a question. So, uh, so the two of you mainly you you the books you were publishing or working with artists were Rizzo. Primarily, yeah. yeah. We, yes. we, we, the Rizzo for us was like a tool to make right, these right. things. But I'm curious, yeah. like in terms of artist books that are being made now, what what other processes are artists using? You know, I think I think it really depends on sort of like what's available to people, because. Um, I guess like in my experience, um, a lot of, for example, like the artist books from the Middle East, um, you know, that I come in contact with, it's a lot of offset press. It's a lot of more traditional uh, processes, but also the materials are a bit kind of more um, like recycled or whatever you can find. And actually those are kind of the books I, I maybe feel like a bit more drawn to. I mean, I love a great Rizzo book. Um, and I think I think Rizzo has also created like a little bit of a 
of a revolution in folks being able to to kind of start their own press and and create their own smaller ecosystems and movements but um that's not to say that everyone making an artist book necessarily falls into that same camp um, um you still see a lot of um traditional like um offset press um there's there's people who make beautiful books um, with um, silk screen and bind them together for smaller runs. Uh, and letterpress is also still, um, um, you know, there's, there's now like polymer plates that, that people can make new. So it's not just, you know, setting lead type. Um, so there's, there's kind of various ways that people yeah, are I think stuff. I think any <laughs> possible printmaking or reproducible medium, uh, artist books are being made out of. Okay. So like textiles, um, UV printing, laser engraving, uh, ceramic tiles, trash. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. anything. Cheese, like craft, craft cheese. Yeah, um, there, there's, there's an artist named Denzer who just did a, he bound, I think 10 or 15 slices of um, craft cheese. Um, <laughs> And uh, so it's really. Is that our climate? Wait a minute. I think <laughs> it, I, there are huge discussions about it in the among the <laughs> conservation community because some sure libraries that. have actually added it to their collections. And you know, I know we were considering one, or Ben was offering us one for Watson Library at the Met. And we were thinking, like, do we need to get a refrigerator for this? Is that to be and he was saying, you know, it was on exhibition at Center for Book Arts for several months and didn't really seem to have deteriorated at all. But, um, you know, I'll kind of, yeah, there's, I'll, I'll see if I can find the chat. Like, there's a whole thread about conservators just kind of going crazy about this. And, you know, and I think especially the conservators who's were at institutions where curators had bought the book for, you know, their collections. So, uh, so Jared, that brings up my, uh, I had a couple other questions. One, how do you decide on what artists you want to work with? I mean, do you look for them? I know one of the things I love about uh, Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop is that when they do their SIP fellowship in the summer, where I forget how many artists, about seven artists get to work with them, get a uh, stipend and they help them make prints is that they're, uh, they like people who apply who have never made a print before. Mm -hmm. So uh, like with Chikaya Booker, when they when you started doing prints with Chikaya Booker, she had never made a print before, which is amazing. Uh, and now she's looking print crazy. So I'm wondering, yeah. do, are you, do you approach artists who you just like their work and you suggest to them, hey, you know what, how would you like to do a book? Um, I mean, I think that they, I mean, we're, we're really, limited. I mean, we have, I mean, artist books and zines are really kind of a very small, very small segment of what we collect at the Met at, and at Watson Library. Watson is primarily like a research library. So a collection, most of what we, you know, we narrowed down, but collect nearly 20,000 books a year, exhibition catalogs, artist monographs. Um, and we might get a total of, you know, in a year, 400 or 500 um, artist books, uh, at largely through donation at this point and seen. So when we're collecting, they tend to be affordable things. They tend to be um, more recently, much more kind of artists of color um, because there's a disparity or kind of some of the gaps that we're, we're trying to fill in in terms of representation in the collection. And there's just great work being done and it's, easily accessible and and here you know we kind of know i mean endless editions and paul john is one of the big sources and kind of bringing letting people have their voice and kind of you know bringing things to print um printed matter has been doing a really good job of of kind of profiling and making this material more available um for institutions um it really kind of runs the gamut there are in terms of some of the people i think tia blasting game i know she was an um she was a resident at i know um IPCNY, and I think she also was a, a, that combined project with Blackburn too, right? I think she was doing some printing. She did. Blackburn. She took a class uh, as the residency from IPCNY, and then also was a uh, a fellow at the Center for Book Arts. And um, and she's an artist who, because some artists, I mean, in terms of the scale, some artists will, will do one book a year. I mean, it takes them an entire year. They put that much labor into it. It might be handmade paper. It's all hand printed. I mean, it, it's really, maybe there are, you know, lino cuts or wood cuts or something. Um, 
but T is an example also. So she has very high end books because she spent a year making them. And then she'll also in the same interest of having her work out there and be accessible, she'll do a one sheet kind of like zine or something, you know, um, that's a 20 or $30 publication. Um, a lot of it is, you know, I personally, I, I, a book has to say something, it has to be important or relevant. Um, there are, you know, we, we have a lot of books that are just books and beautiful objects and amazing objects and the craft is wonderful. Um, we don't generally have a budget for that kind of material because it's more just books as objects. It has to have something or kind of say something. That's again, just personal preference, but a lot of what we get in terms of the higher end artist books, especially for the Watson art, um, tend to be things that artists donate or collectors donate because we don't really have an out a budget allocation for those works. Um, Excellent, thank you, Jared. And, and uh, PJ and Anthony, what about with you, like in terms of uh, the like endless editions, how do you f find the artists? Are they coming to you? Are you looking for artists who've never made a book? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think when we started endless editions, um, we started with exhibitions and books because there were, we found so few opportunities for ourselves and, and the people that we thought were um, uh, not, you know, marginalized in, in a way, or just like, how, how do you get into exhibitions and galleries if you don't already have that connection? How do you, how do you do that? And um, so I think when we first started, it was kind of shaping the way we worked with artists, at least for me, it was kind of like a learning of how we worked with artists. And a lot of that experience came from working at the print shop. But I think uh, primarily, Endless Editions publishes from our copy shop residency, which was born out of this kind of difficult path towards publishing with artists. In the beginning, we, we reached out to artists that we saw and uh, we just did cold calls to them, but we also had an open call to sports, which was a satirical periodical. And we would put out sports monthly and just have an ongoing open call and we'd have an editor go through the submissions and sports um, was born. And I think I'm actually working on the, the, the annual sports right now on this residency. Uh, and as of late, we've changed that into like a open call format with a theme. There was a chess themed sports, there was a poetry themed sports, and this year it's a like a shutdown and recipe themed sports. Cool. Um, and and I, I, so it was, uh, yeah, so it was, um, it was when we were asking our friends and, and hosting sports, it kind of was like really frustrating to me. I, like my, my goals were to work with underrepresented artists, artists that I didn't know and that I felt needed a voice. And so that's where this copy shop residency was born. I was like, well, maybe what I don't want is um, to just take a PDF and make a book on my own independent of the artist. I want the artist here with me. I want to be teaching the artist about printmaking and how we're going to make the book together. And they would split the labor with me. We would work, spend time together. And uh, that led to, you know, further realizations that maybe more important than the book objects we're making is the community that we're building. And that was mostly based around the, uh, the events that we did. So it was how we find our artists now is by hosting events and, and, and creating community and then through that community interaction, we'll either select you to publish a project or you'll come through the residency that we host. But it is all about the people. No, that's excellent, thank you. And so Anthony, I got uh, the next thing I wanted to ask. Sure. Okay, who buys artist books and who sells them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, so... the galleries, is this something uh, gallery stealing or? Well, first of all, you're doing this with, uh, you know, at art fairs and stuff. So maybe you can give us an idea of where this fits in, in terms of collecting and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think like the, really in the art market, the, the artist book started and even I think kind of printed matter started as sort of like an overstock of exhibition catalogs where, um, where people were producing these beautiful catalogs and, um, and kind of like needing a home for, for kind of those things to be appreciated. So, you know, it would be anyone who's going to, to galleries and looking at art and, you know, the same way you would kind of buy like, you know, any kind of book. Um, but I think there, 
there's kind of there's kind of like levels of collectorship. So I think on the kind of um, the more um, on kind of like the lower brow of artist books, kind of like more zines. Um, there's you know there's obviously uh, like free materials that people put out for political reasons, kind of like um, or yeah, kind of, um, yeah, politically bent zines that are free distribution. Um, <clears throat> and one historic one that I would uh, cite is like um, Black Mask, um, which was published in the Lower East Side in the 70s, um, or maybe even, yeah, the early 70s. And that was just sort of like a free political um, artist book that was kind of distributed in the Lower East Side. And then on the higher end of things, you know, there's, um, I think that Josh Smith book that you printed at AWSE or something is like selling, like someone sold one for like thousands of dollars. <laughs> and um, um, and so I think that there's well, there kind of a broad also range. Like, there, there's also like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Justin at the print shop is working on this book with Francis Jetter and it's huge. It's 22 by 30 inches. It's like 40 pieces of chincole relief print and there's maybe going to be 30 made. Each book is thirty thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars, and that's because it took like what four years, five years. There's, they spent five years working on this book, I think. And I, I think the the um, the audience also changes based on geography. Obviously, I'm not just trying to segue into talking about like artist books in the Middle East, but <laughs> I've noticed when when we when we sold books in China like at the big book fairs, the, like there's this culture of kind of like comics and collecting posters and just collecting um, like printed material um, that I, I don't think is the same in like the United States culturally. So there's, there's much more like um, people just kind of like liking printed collectible things that comes from more of, yeah, I, I guess more of like almost like a comic culture. And I think that's kind of a, another part um, of like who's buying this stuff because, um, you, you know, in our experience, like we've gone to extremely high-end antiquarian artist book fairs, um, you know, and have left being like, wow, you know, we maybe made like $30. Um, but the the fairs that have the, the, you know, the huge crowds of young people are the ones that we tend to do the best in because I think there's just kind of, you know, there's, there's an energy for the material and not so much thought towards like building out a collection necessarily. And that's not to say that those, both of those things don't exist, um, so. So with Fully Booked, when you're going to do uh, an art fair, like what are the books that you're bringing with you? Um, so fully booked is actually probably a bit more broad than the, than the scope of like endless editions, um, for example, cause we also do like limited run art books. So we distribute things that would be almost considered kind of like culture magazines, um, everything from that to the handmade. So we, we try to bring, um, you know, a variety of things just based on, um, you know, kind of thinking about what the, what the crowd might be, you know, who the buyer might be. Um, but, you know, Fully Booked was something where we, we kind of wanted it to feel like kind of like a mini bookstore on wheels. So, you know, we had things that were, you know, 70 to $80 and things that were, you know, $2. Um, you had cassette, um, you had cassette tapes. Token yeah, we had cassette tapes and, and merch and stuff like that. Um, but I think also our, uh, you know, our interest was was not so much in selling those things necessarily as much as we kind of realized that the the art community, the young art community in the in the parts of the world that we were focused on, um, you know, don't have places like Printed Matter or the Watson Library where they can go in and see, you know, these like amazing old like Ed Ruscha artist books or something. So we really kept the the definition of, uh, of, you know, what we were carrying very open so that we could like encourage people to make more work and and kind of like establish a platform for people who would want to to maybe eventually submit. 
So, um, so we had kind of a unique approach in that where we, where we almost worked backwards, you know. Um, but yeah, we sold ev everywhere, and uh, you know, I think everyone has like a different, like a different, like um, you know, it, it's just surprising sometimes, like you know, what one community responds to and, and another one doesn't, um, you know, based on your selection. Excellent, thank you, Anthony. Yeah. So it's uh, it's five to seven, so maybe we can just take a few minutes to do questions. Not sure how the best way to do questions is. Derek, are you there? Should we just do it in the chat room? Yeah, you can. I mean, I, I think there's a, not so many people. You can just uh, raise your hand and ask a question. Okay. Somebody want to raise their hand and ask a question? I can't see everybody at once, though. Uh, Adrian. Adrian. Hi. Thanks. Oh, for once, I'm not muted. Um, <laughs> uh, I was interested in the idea of this schism that it, I think exists between artists making handmade books, which of course are so beautiful, incredible, and artists who are pub self-publishing um, with Lulu, Blurb, Mad Cloud, artist books, not books about art or books about their art, but mm -hmm. artist books. Um, because I'm doing that and also um, um, because the, these companies have you know, constraints, just like any technology. However, it, because they have constraints, it off, also offers a lot of freedom in terms of, in another way, just like, you know, the Olipo group, um, had constraints about what they could, you know, write and produce this marvelous literature. So my question is, is would that would sell published books fall in any way under artist books? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that kind of to what I was um, saying previously that I think that it's, it's quite open. And I think that by, I don't know, I'm of the belief that having like a really narrow definition of this doesn't really help anybody. Because I think if the work is really strong, then, um, and then it's really strong. So, um, I mean, I could also think of plenty of, you know, notable artist books that use print on demand services as kind of part of their kind of central idea. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, what, ha what happens is usually I do um, a collector's edition, bear with me, <laughs> uh, which is the book and then some objects, either the book as a, an object, like a mummified book, a, a copy of the book that's mummified or, you know, mm -hmm. wrapped in a lot of linen and with lots of smelly stuff and, um, or an, a, an, a, a print. Etc. So it's a package. It's like a package. Also, the books they do are, have some form of algorithmic generation. So, for instance, I did an all textbook in 2015 that had um, many iterations of text with the same text, but iterated through an algorithm completely differently and put 12 of those up on Amazon. They were all the same text, completely different, and all had separate ISBN numbers. And, you know, I, I'm sure it's art. Not only because nothing sells. <laughs> <laughs> that's the defining, yeah. It sounds, it sounds like art to me. <laughs> no. Next question. Did you have a question, Amber? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was, um, I mean, just in the time of COVID. Um, so I, I went to Pratt and we were like mounting our thesis shows like right when things like shut down and um, and I had a, an artist book in my show and I was thinking about um, if this does open up and I do get to put this in a show, like what is the future of artist books and people touching things again, people wanting mm -hmm. to interact with an object again I don't know, so I just wanna see like your guys' perspective. Maybe Jared too, like you have a lot of experience with multiple people coming and touching like very precious objects. 
don't know, what do you guys see as like things moving forward with artist books in these new times? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, it is. And so much of the, you know, the artist book is like, an, and so central to it is like the haptic thing. I mean, it's the touch, you know, and especially the paper stock and things, but it's, it's the, the sequence, the pagination, I mean, kind of the flipping through it's the act, it's, it's, you know, an involved thing. Um, right. And everybody talks about museums reopening and going and looking at art and, and touching books is such a different thing, you know? Um, but even I know, yeah, I mean, I know within the library, we're looking at constantly, they're doing tests about how long, you know, germs might stay, you know, the quarantine period for things and when things get returned. But, um, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I, I know places like Printed Matter, the Strand, I mean, they're still allowing browsing, you know, I think, um, but it, it is quite, I mean, I can't really picture like a book fair, you know, um, like a zine tent, you know, like <laughs> at PS1 mm -hmm. happening where it's just kind of, um, yeah, I know that's really, that might be something, yeah, again, far off, it definitely is, is yeah. I mean, ultimately, though, you know, the book does eventually, I mean, unless, unless you're looking at it in a library or browsing at the store, like eventually, the hope is that it becomes kind of a, like a solitary, it does eventually become like a solitary moment, right, where you're with your book at home, and it, you know, it lives within your shelves. So, like, I think it's a really interesting question of like how how they operate in those public displays in it like for instance in a gallery but you know I th I, I still kind of feel like they're meant to be enjoyed like in privacy in a in a weird way um, so in that sense I'm not I'm not sure like their that their like function is too much changed. Um, I also used to think of when I would go to fairs, like have, you know, having the handling copies out and I would kind of lose a little bit of sleep at night, like in pre-pandemic world, just thinking of like all the hands that touch them. Um, so I just kind of, I kind of think like, I don't know, it, it's kind of just the same, it's kind of, yeah, I don't know how much, uh, aside from the fact that of people not being in the same place, I don't know how much like the, the touch aspect is going to change. That's just even, you know. yeah. I was going to say, and even like pre-pandemic, again, like exhibiting artist books was always a thing. So even if you had had an exhibition, would it be a copy that you had out for people to kind of page through, or do you have to pick the one spread, you know, and that's all people get to see, and they're not really experiencing mm -hmm. it, you know? Anyway, that's always kind of a big challenge. No oh, man, weird times. <clears throat> Any other questions? <laughs> Anybody want to raise their hand? Well, there was there was one question in the chat before from from David just about the kind of he was just mentioning the idea of Rizzo as like a punk process, um, and I was just saying that there's also kind of like a more high end scientific approach to Rizzo now um, in places like the Netherlands um, and PJ know some of those studios and I was wondering if you might be able to just kind of talk about that world of Rizzo which is more kind of color theory and yeah totally I mean um I I do think uh Rizzo is punk um and in fact Jan Dirk and Joyce Gooley from Knust Extra Pool uh they were squatters and they earned the rights to their building uh, by squatting in it in Nijmegen and turning their building into um, an art residency, music concert hall, exhibition space, um, and cooperative living. And uh, they produced zines as part of the underground and with punk musicians in, in uh, the Netherlands. Um, but they are also si simultaneously, because they've been do doing it for so long, they're also maybe the best pre-press uh, operators for Rizzo um, and printing. And so, so you know, Jan, Jan Dirk de Wilde, um, arguably the most punk man at the New York Art Book Fair. Uh, he, uh, you know, is running four virtual machines on his computer and he's running like Windows 95 to run this Adobe plugin. He's running Windows XP to run this plugin for Acrobat. He uses these profiles. He's got this incredible workflow, this 
highly, highly technical. And, um, you know, I would, I would love to just like be able to download his brain because it doesn't make any sense to me what he's doing. Um, but, uh, there, there, and, and there are others here in the States, uh, resolve that really have dialed it in, but you, you know, in, in comparison, Jan Dirk is punk and, and, you know, doesn't like spending any money on these things and, and resolve put a lot of money into, into buying proprietary software, creating things for, for precise printing. But, um, I think the best description of Rezo is it's, it's not so much, um, that it's Rezo that makes it incredible. It's that, uh, you have this power to print and produce anything and distribute it uh, at your will. Um, and I think maybe that's the most punk thing about it is you don't have to get approval from anybody. You don't have to ask questions um, and you can put content out. And uh, I think the most punk uh, response is to receive the criticism from those objects that you've put out and and reflect upon them and grow from that, uh, which I think uh, mm -hmm. is the best part about running a Rezo uh, shop and, and creating a Rezo community is that I've had countless opportunities to reflect on my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and, I want to uh, make a book. I want to do a Rezo book now. <laughs> for sure. It's been, it's really fun. And then I think that's another part of uh, running a Rezo studio is that artists come in and they have no idea what's happening and they create something insane and you get to make it with them. And then halfway through they ask, they look at you and they're like, did I make something crazy? And I was like, if you couldn't tell by now, yes, you did. And, uh, but we'll, we'll get it through. You know, the best part about running a Rezo shop is that you just get to say yes to everything, all these crazy ideas and, and fun things that would, people would say no to. Um, otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, are there any, is there a last question? Anybody? I can't see everybody. We're Let's good? see. There's, there's one last question that popped up. Um, if, yeah, if we have some time, um, are there any particular resources you would like to suggest uh, to artists or advice for artists looking to share and show their artist books? Um, um, Go ahead, I, I, yeah, I would say, um, you know, there's, depending on where you are, like just thinking about New York, there's definitely loads of resources that come through Center for Book Arts. Um, Jared beat me to the punch there. Um, um, you know, uh, Printed Matter, obviously. And th I mean, there, I feel like there's, there's loads of smaller um, shops right now that I think just depending on like what it is you're producing. Like I really like Two Bridges Arts and Music in um, kind of like the Lower East Side, um, which I think just has like a really interesting taste. Um, um, and, and, you know, one of the nice things about that, that I've enjoyed like throughout the years of this process is also kind of getting, it's like also the cross between uh, art and kind of like running a small business you know, with, with these small shops. So, um, so in that sense, yeah, I guess I, I would mainly look, the Center for Book Arts is really the center place and uh, yeah, to look for resources. And then other than that, I feel like it's like just about exploration and like. Yeah, I, I um, when we first started Endless Editions, how did we like get our books into people's hands? How did we actively do that first? first couple launches we did were at the basketball courts at McCarran Park. So we launched sports just by word of mouth. We made a Facebook event. Uh, so creating events that include larger communities than just yourself is like an, an automatic way to share your work. If you have 15 people contributing to a project, at least you'll have 15 people there, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> and from that, it grows and grows and grows. Um, but I would also say that to make a distinction between what you want, do you want to sell your things or do you just want to celebrate your things? And I think that those making that distinction is really important um, because to share your work is really easy. You just have to find willing people to look at it and sharing space with those people is also a really easy way to share your work. So going to the Center for Book Arts, International Print Center of New York, IPCNY has an open call 
three times a year. It's a free open call where you can submit your artist books made. And then uh, taking classes at places like the print shop, uh, Lower East Side um, Print Shop, Center for Book Arts, Pioneer Works, MoMA, Met, all of these places have books or print related things. And if they, if somebody likes prints, I can guarantee you they will be interested in books. Um, and then if you're thinking about selling your work, that's a, that's a little bit of a longer story. Um, and I don't, uh, I'm, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> selling is always the hard part. Okay, any other last question or? We're kind of out of time here. We're good. So I would like oh, Roberta. To... Roberta has a question. Oh, good, Roberta. You got to unmute. Okay. Hey. Not so much a question, but just don't forget for looking at from Lee D'Artiste, their artist books, New York Public Library when the building reopens. I put, I put that in the chat. Story. Just for you, Roberta, just as a, as a testament, yeah. I know, right, there are collections, that is a collection there, largely, thank you, thanks to Roberta, and it was really, yeah, I mean, kind of the champions, I know, from artist bookmakers and booksellers among the institutions that were there throughout providing decades of support. Roberta, you know, as a person also was, you know, and NYPL as an institution played a pivotal role, and, and there's an amazing collection to show for that, so, yeah. And it, it, it doesn't require an appointment. So I mean, when the building reopens, this is the research library. Uh, Spencer collection where the Lieb d'Artiste, things like my favorite all time Lieb d'Artiste, Matisse's poesy. For that, you do have to request in advance, but otherwise in the print room, filling out a simple form with the hours that when the building reopens that the print room is open, instant gratification. So, so cool. it's, yeah, it's open arms. Thank you so much, Roberta. I miss oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> I miss you too. <laughs> open studios. Roberta's the only one. She goes to every single studio. It comes three days. I boy, I missed open studios this year. Yeah. Anyway, is there is any other last question or we'll I think we're we're good. And please, I just want to thank Paul John, Anthony Tino, and Jared. Thanks, everyone. Great. Lovely, generous informative gentlemen. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for showing up. Thank you. Okay. Bye hey, bye. Thank, thank you everybody. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.